This video is sponsored by Babbel. Click the link in the description to get 60% off a subscription with Babbel's Black Friday sale. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Plain Bagel. I'm your host, Richard Coffin. As you probably heard, we got some pretty big news last week that we work the chic office leasing company with the mission statement of elevating the world's consciousness and lofty goals of solving the problem of children without parents and eradicating world hunger filed for chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Bummer. Now, as devastating as this probably is for kombucha drinkers around the world, it was a largely expected move. In September, with their quarterly earnings, management highlighted that they had substantial doubt around the company's ability to continue to stay in business. And just last month, they announced that they were going to miss two of their upcoming interest payments. And really, ever since the company's failed IPO in 2019, there have been questions about the firm's longevity. But this is 2023, a company going under, not really that big of a deal. We've already covered several stories of companies going bust this year alone. What makes WeWork notable is that just a few years ago, they were valued at $47 billion, making them the most valuable startup in the US. And with $22 billion invested into WeWork over its lifetime, it makes it one of the biggest venture capital failures in corporate American history. Now you might be wondering, geez, how did this company fall so far from grace? The better question is, how did they get as far as they did? Because the thing about WeWork is they never really worked, at least for their investors. They never recorded a single year profit, had a history of self-dealing, conflicts of interest, and questionable acquisitions, and didn't seem to have a solid idea of what they even were. What the company did have, however, was an incredibly eccentric co-founder, Adam Newman, uh, known for walking around the office barefoot, partying on his private jet, and frequently letting the tequila flow at company-related events. But still, he managed to convince venture capitalists to invest billions of dollars into his business over the past decade. So in today's video, I'll give a bit of background about the company, talk about how it failed, and discuss the implications of its bankruptcy. Uh, because outside of just being a fascinating story, when you get into the weeds of who this Adam Newman character was and how he managed to raise all this money, this bankruptcy does actually have meaningful consequences for certain markets, especially within America. So we'll touch on all that today. But let's start from the beginning. What is WeWork? Well, as mentioned, they are an office leasing startup that was founded in 2010 by Adam Newman and his co-founder, Miguel McKelvey. And outside of trying to help us all uh, mentally ascend, the actual core function of WeWork was they would go out and lease larger office spaces, uh, refurbish it and split it up into these sort of micro offices with a more communal feel to it, and then lease those spaces out with more flexible terms, but a bit of a markup in the price to startups, entrepreneurs, and really anyone who's looking for more flexible terms when renting office space, acting as a sort of office middleman. Now for our main character, Adam Newman, this wasn't actually his first venture. He'd already tried a few other businesses such as a collapsible heel, as well as a brand of padded baby jeans called crawlers with the slogan of just because they don't tell you, doesn't mean they don't hurt, Jesus. <laughs> but WeWork itself seemed to take off, and to be fair, it was a solid offering for customers. Offices were designed to foster creativity and collaboration, often had this sort of premium feel to them. And aside from flexible terms that would let people go, say, month to month, for example, it was a great place to build connections and network with other entrepreneurs and startups in your space. The company also spent pretty lavishly on refurbishments and amenities to make for a unique work experience, as well as for free kombucha and beer on tap. Unfortunately, the one party that the WeWork business model wasn't great for was WeWork. Uh, as mentioned, they never earned a profit, which makes sense when you consider how flippant they really were with their money. Uh, but outside of that, there just wasn't enough demand to match what WeWork's ambitious growth targets were. The company growing its number of locations 10x from 2015 to 2019. The company also had a pretty unattractive risk profile by they themselves leasing out properties for 15 years and longer, and then turning around and renting that space out on a month to month basis in some cases, they obviously had this asymmetry between the uh, costs that they had to face and the revenues they were bringing in, not to mention that their target customer of the startup and the entrepreneur were likely to be the first to close up shop if there were a recession, which considering they were operating for over a decade was something they were going to run into sooner or later. But if history is any indication, the one thing that trumps an unattractive business model when it comes to venture capital is a quirky leader with a strange aesthetic. So with Adam Newman allegedly bringing vodka water guns to company retreats, aspiring to live forever and one day be president of the world, it's needless to say, Venture capitalists loved him. His wife, Rebecca Newman, also really contributed to Adam's image here, uh, known for trying to incorporate spirituality into the business and even going so far as to allegedly fire people after just a few minutes of meeting them because she, 
quote unquote, didn't like their energy. But as ridiculous as all these things are, Adam was apparently a very motivating and charismatic individual. And he had a lot of success selling venture capital investors on the future of the company. And when it comes to private investing, there just aren't the same rules when it comes to uh, reporting requirements and disclosures. And Adam was apparently able to convince many that WeWork was more than just an office leasing company, that they were a physical social network in the business of offering space as a service, a play on software as a service, and they should be valued as a high growth tech company. Where have I heard that before? And he saw a future where the company would take its way of business and expand it into other areas, with him even trying his hand at doing so, uh, with ventures like We Live, We Bike, and We Toke. All right, I made up the last one, but I think it would fit in. Now, WeWork did have some tech initiatives to try and separate itself from all the other office landlords who could basically do the same thing, uh, such as an AI system that tried to gain insight into how its office space was used. The problem is, they kind of sucked and they weren't very fruitful for the company's operations. But with money flowing in from investors, the company did manage to roughly double its revenues every year leading up to 2019. Now the sort of growth at all costs type of strategy is something that might work for a software as a service type business, uh, where for example, there's a very small cost to onboarding new customers. And there's this future state where you're able to reduce your costs and just generate profits from the user base you've built. But again, with WeWork, there wasn't really that future state or that possibility. Uh, there were a lot of substitutes with very low switching costs given the flexibility of the office leasing terms and obviously expanding capacity was very expensive. Nonetheless, this pitch of we're actually a tech company seemed to work and garner enough support from VCs to help fuel this rapid expansion uh, with their capital mainly with the support of people like Masayoshi Sun, the CEO of SoftBank Group, who over the company's lifespan, allegedly invested $18.5 billion into the business. With the company reaching 528 locations across the world uh, and reaching that $47 billion valuation in 2019 with a round of financing from SoftBank. But last in 2019, the year that the company would decide to try and go public, the cracks started to show because despite Adam's success in the world of venture capital, the public market proved to be a lot less hospitable. When they publicly filed their S1, which is the form that's filled by companies looking to have a security listed on a national exchange, uh, they weren't really met with roaring applause, but instead uh, sort of gasps, and they were really ripped to shreds by uh, anyone who read through their statements. First of all, the filing was pretty atypical. It started off with this weird poetic bit, a pretty grand introduction for a company that basically just provided office space. There's also this random photo collage partway through, but worse than the company's marketing decisions were their finances. The losses were staggering, with their operating expenses being double their revenue each year. They also had these massive long-term liabilities on their balance sheet because of all the leases they had entered, and their complicated organizational structure didn't make a lot of sense to investors. But arguably more concerning than all this was the shady stuff it revealed. WeWork was leasing properties that were owned in part by Adam Newman, and the company disclosed that it had bought the trademark for the word we from Adam Newman for roughly $6 million, a deal he only ended up reversing after the public backlash. In fact, the response was so negative that WeWork ended up postponing its IPO and Adam Newman was pressured to step down. So with Adam Newman out of the way, we finally have this possible turnaround point uh, with someone new at the helm to finalize and, and focus our strategy and help WeWork achieve its full potential, right? Uh, yeah, needless to say, it ended up being a pretty bad time to be in the office space, uh, literally, as a bunch of people canceled their leases, causing revenue to fall. Now, in October 2021, the company would still actually end up going public, this time via a special purpose acquisition company, or SPAC. That's right, SPACs, so the big fad of a couple years ago, uh, whereby a bunch of investors basically go public with an empty company, if you will, and then use the funds they generate to buy a private company, merge the two, and thereby uh, end up taking this firm public without going through the typical IPO process. Uh, at this point, however, the company was only valued at $9 billion, an 80% decline from just two years ago. And if the pandemic and the beaten down valuation weren't bad enough for this company, just six months later, the Federal Reserve would start hiking its interest rates, further pressuring the real estate space, the economy as a whole, and bringing us to where we are today, with the company in the second quarter of this year sporting liabilities of $19 billion, the majority of which are these long-term leases, 
despite only having itself $15 billion in total assets. With sales being slightly down since 2019, despite the company still spending pretty aggressively on capital expenditures. Now with a portfolio of over 800 properties across 35 different countries, the company has filed for chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Now chapter 11 is often misconstrued as meaning that it's the end of this business. It's actually an opportunity for the company to try and turn itself around. It allows it to continue operating while giving it some respite from its liabilities, its creditors, and in this case, its landlords that it owes rent to. And it does appear that the company intends to reemerge. It's already gotten 90% of its bondholders to agree to a $3 billion conversion of debt into equity. And before filing for bankruptcy, they had already renegotiated 590 of their leases, essentially wiping out $12.7 billion of future rent payments that they would otherwise owe. Now they're still looking to negotiate with 400 other landlords, but this really does give WeWork the opportunity to break all these long-term contracts that would otherwise likely drive it into the ground. But to be clear, any company that does emerge from this is going to be a fraction of the size of what WeWork was beforehand, and public investors have virtually lost everything, with the stock down 99%, with it being very possible that the shares end up worthless. Now obviously, this sucks for any public investor who looked past the weird messaging of their filings and really believed in Adam Newman's vision for a WeWork world. But there are wider implications outside of just um, investors losing their money because it comes at a pretty awful time for commercial real estate. As you might know, this area was already suffering pretty significantly thanks again to the pandemic, which forced a lot of businesses to shut down and forced a lot of companies to have their employees work from home. Now in the US, over 17% of office supply is already vacant. So when you have one of the largest uh, private tenants all of a sudden try to pull out of the space and end all these long-term contracts, it's only exacerbating that pain, which will not only hurt property owners who again are losing a paying tenant, but also likely financial institutions who lend money to the space. Uh, because if the person you gave a massive loan to to build or buy an office property is no longer able to earn money from its tenants, you might lose all the money you lent them. With this already having been a big headwind for financial institutions in 2023, so with this announcement, obviously there's more pain to be expected. And with roughly 42% of WeWork's occupancies being located in New York, Boston, and San Francisco alone, those markets are going to experience a pretty acute effect from all this. So that's the situation around WeWork. And with the recent guilty verdict handed down to SBF regarding the whole FTX scandal, you might think this is 0-2 for uh, quirky startup founders. But don't worry too much about Adam. He's uh, doing just fine. He was out of the front lines for a bit by now, and he's already on to his next startup called Flow, which received a $1 billion valuation and a $350 million investment last year, uh, despite not having any operations yet, with the business looking to operate multifamily residential properties aimed at promoting community, which I can only imagine offers a pretty good opportunity for Adam to repurpose those vodka water guns from WeWork. And while Adam's net worth was hit by the downfall of WeWork, he was also provided a $106 million settlement payment uh, when he was laid off, given a $185 million non-compete agreement. Uh, he sold a bunch of his shares to venture capitalists for hundreds of millions of dollars, and even borrowed $740 million, nearly a billion dollars from SoftBank against the value of his shares, which have plummeted. But if you thought this would leave some bad blood between Adam Newman and WeWork, you'd be sorely mistaken, with there actually being rumors that he might actually come back to helm the business through the tumultuous period ahead. Sorry, Timmy, Adam needs his nerf super soaker back. But regardless of where things go from here, it's already a moment in history, again, being one of the biggest venture capital failures that we've ever seen. And in a way, it shows some of the consequences of having a prolonged period of low interest rates. Not only can unsustainable companies last longer, given that the cost of capital is so low, so they can keep fueling their losses, uh, but the investors who provide that capital tend to be less diligent, as this story probably portrays. With the reason being that there's not that same opportunity cost to just park your money somewhere and earn a decent return, so investors are more incentivized to take on risk and maybe believe one too many entrepreneurs that their business is actually a tech company that's going to change the world. But as we see, when rates rise, it really trims the fat. But that's a video. Before I sign off, I do want to give a quick thank you to today's sponsor, Babbel. A quick sort of fun fact that you probably don't know about me. Both my parents are actually from the Gaspé Coast, which is the far tip of Canada's French-speaking province, Quebec. Thing is, despite growing up around a lot of French at home, I was never really fluent, and I never really wanted to learn French as a kid. Sorry, mom. <laughs> These days, I've really come to regret that, not only because of the family aspect of it, but because I actually live and work in Ottawa, the bilingual capital of Canada. 
uh, which is why I know you can call it Putin, which is the Francophone version, in addition to poutine, which is the anglicized version of it. So leave me alone. Let me eat my gravy cheese fries in peace. Anyway, uh, Babbel. <laughs> if you aren't familiar, Babbel is an app for learning languages. They have 14 different languages you can learn from. I've been taking their French course and I've really enjoyed it. Outside of just obviously teaching the basics and helping you ease into a new language if you aren't familiar, they really focus on solidifying the conversational stuff and giving you that context around how you would pronounce things in different situations that are practical things you might actually run into. They have a variety of activities that include matching terms, typing out words, and even practicing your pronunciation. Lessons are also typically under 10 minutes, which makes it easy to squeeze in when you find a bit of downtime here and there. And the nice thing is that new terms are frequently showcased in sample conversations, which I personally find really helpful. So if you'd like to try it out yourself, you can click the link in the description below to get 60% off during Babbel's Black Friday sale. Thank you Babbel for sponsoring today's video and thank you guys for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do make sure to like, subscribe, all that good stuff Stuff. It does help the channel tremendously. And let me know your thoughts in the comments down below, especially if you're someone who invested in WeWork, uh, what your thoughts were at the time and what you're thinking hearing all this now. Thanks again for joining. And as always, take it easy on the kombucha.